it's hard to beat the satisfaction from completing your own 3D printed project, assuming that it works. Today, I'm gonna to share with you a working project and share six tips that you can apply to your own design projects to help them be successful. My backyard is now full of 3D printed projects that are helping me look after our pets in a more efficient and automated way. And these days I'm having a really high success rate in turning the ideas that I have into reality. So I'm gonna share with you six tips or design principles that should apply to your own projects to help them be more successful. But first, let's give an overview of my current project. Let's provide some context and explain this particular project. Previously, I made a video on automating a bunch of things in my backyard, mostly related to pets. But then after that video, tragedy struck and a snake killed both of my dogs. So to keep the new puppies safe, we've been doing a range of things like putting up extra fencing and another very important step, trying to remove all rats and mice so the snake weren't attracted to the yard. Previously, I shared this modification to the goat feeding system that added a sealed shroud between the dispenser and the eating tray. And I'm pleased to say this has been remarkably effective. It only took a week or so before the rats gave up and went elsewhere. But worryingly, elsewhere is not very far away, and that's the chicken feeder. I think it's clear from this footage that the rats are having the time of their life with this. It's easy, safe food, their nest is next door, but this is where they come for their nightly feed, so I needed to take action. Originally, I was going to make a modified version of the old feeder, with a vertical tube and then a section that only a chicken can get inside. And by only a chicken, I mean the goats can't reach. I purchased this enormous PVC stormwater pipe and started working on a design that would have solar controlled doors that would slide down and cut off access to the food during the nighttime from the rats. But then I thought I was making this too complicated. So instead I took inspiration from this manual seed spreader. As you can see, there is a trigger to open a little trapdoor inside and then a handle on the right hand side that spins a wheel with fins underneath so the seeds fall through and get sprayed everywhere. Here it is in action. As you can see, the seeds don't fall down that well, but I think if I have a design like this, I can put it up higher where the rats will never be able to access it. Fast forward to the end of the project and the whole thing was successful. Like the rest of this system, it's all controlled by Wi-Fi and I will put it on a timer. As you can see, there's a constant stream of poultry mix coming out the front, spread nicely as long as the motor is spinning. And even without the trapdoor, as soon as that motor stops spinning, the seed mix will naturally come to a stop. The mix ends up spread evenly over a pretty large area, and the chickens do seem to enjoy foraging and finding their meals this way. So that's how it turned out, but what were the important principles that I followed to make sure that it would? Tip number one is to segment large designs into smaller parts, and I do this on pretty much every project. We'll start with the downsides, and in my opinion, there's pretty much only one, and that's that assembly will take longer and require more hardware, but the advantages are numerous. Here I have temporarily merged all of the body components together into one single object. And if we look inside, we can see it's extremely complicated and we have somewhat of a labyrinth. Now these rear sections at the back where the motor sits would require a ton of support and really it's not viable to print it like this. Access to this rear motor cavity would also be difficult, making assembly near impossible. So instead, we split the main housing into two pieces. That makes the upper housing a simple piece that can print without any support material, and the lower housing, with some attention to detail, can be printed without support material too. And because each individual piece is smaller, that reduces the requirement for a really large printer to print the whole lot in one go. But there's other reasons to segment up your design, and one of them is to avoid the need for a whole bunch of reprinting. For instance, this section here takes a Deutsch two-pin connector plug that will slot in and then clip into place. And due to this opening needing to be in exact size, there's a fair chance that this would need to be printed several times before it's perfect. So imagine if these two pieces were printed as one piece. Any tiny mistake with this bottom plug means reprinting the whole thing again, and that's a six hour print. So if we segment it up, yes, we'll need two additional bolts to attach the two together. But if there's a problem with this part of the design, we're only printing a 20 minute piece instead of the entire thing. Another piece segmented up is this bearing holder. Once again, we have the dimension that we need to get exactly right for the bearing to fit without wobbling around. 
So separating that part will give us that flexibility without risking needing to print the whole thing again if it's slightly off. This divider is another piece following that same philosophy. I wanted it to be really snug behind the drive gear to stop any debris from getting inside the motor. And by making it a separate slide in piece, I can very quickly iterate this portion, getting it closer and closer without risking needing to print the whole thing again if it's off the first time. Finally, by segmenting down, we can have a tighter design. One aim with this design was to reduce voids, and that meant packaging around the seed wheel as tightly as possible. Because the bearings underneath the wheel were held separately, I could drop the wheel down to get on the drive gear, and then have just enough room to tilt up the wheel and slide this bearing plate underneath. So again, the downside was needing six more bolts to hold these two together, but the upside is I can have really small clearances between these moving parts for better control of debris during operation. And one more reason to segment is so you can make different parts different materials. For instance, this rain shield that's designed to collect any rain and take it downhill to the back where it can drip off on one of these points. By segmenting this, not only can it print without support, but it could also be printed in TPU, which meant I could get a really tight seal between the part and the PVC pipe without worrying about the part not fitting. Next up, measure, model, and even simulate every possible thing you can before hitting print, I mean. Typically, this means modeling any real life hardware that will be integrated into your model. So for me, the PVC pipe, this little solenoid in as much detail as I could, and the very first thing that I modeled, this motor. And looking at this, because I took these steps, you might think that this motor would fit beautifully into this housing. But I tripped myself up here because I didn't model the terminals at the back. And as it turns out, that plus a combination of it just being a tight fit mean the motor would not slot into place. In fact, the only way I could get the motor in was to press the sides of the housing together to flex it into an oval shape and create just enough clearance, but I didn't think this was a good idea moving forward. There's just too much risk of damage to the motor or cracking the printed part. So what I should have done is made an assembly where you can freely move parts about and test fitted the assembly, and then I would have seen that things were going to collide. Obviously in real life, you can angle things to get them around each other. You can also do this in the assembly. It will be a little bit awkward, but it's better than nothing. The final version had this bulge greatly exaggerated, but because of this required change, I had to spend another six hours and all of the filament required to print this part again. The newer revision did fit the motor perfectly, but I was annoyed that I didn't follow my own advice in modeling every little detail as well as simulating assembly as this ended up wasting a lot of time in filament. Next up, something I do in almost every project is design in future proofing. On this project, the very first part I finished was this upper housing. It was based on fitment with the PVC pipe and also packaging around the wheel and the motor, which I was confident would fit within this silhouette. So I actually sent this part to the printer before I had finished designing anything else. And the reason I could do this and it ended up being okay is because I added in future proofing. These holes around the outside are for attaching this piece to the PVC pipe, but these nine holes on the underside were for bolting the rest of the assembly to this part. I didn't know how many I would need, so I just put in nine to make sure I would have enough regardless of what was sitting where in future. As it turned out, I only needed six of these holes to attach the two halves together, but that was plenty strong. And I really don't care that the three unused holes in the upper part, as that's a small cost in return for the flexibility I added to keep the project moving forward. Even though I'm not using it yet, I've positioned and mounted this solenoid in the front corner. If required, I'll use it to help open this lid that will fall back shut with gravity to keep the insides protected. Exactly how I will do this, I am unsure. So I've designed in three holes that will take an M3 by 30 millimeter bolt and that will give me the flexibility to add pulleys, gears, levers, whatever I need to solve this problem if the need arises. The hope is that by putting in too many holes rather than not enough, I'll avoid the need to reprint this whole part in future. And this is something I regularly do with my designs. Just add extra mounting holes because you never know down the track if you'll end up wanting accessories and add-ons. And if you do, by future proofing, you won't need to reprint parts to accommodate them. This tip also came true for this project with the electronics. As when I first built the box, I didn't put in as many outputs as I needed. Instead, I put in as many as I could fit, meaning there was one spare and ready to go for this new chicken feeder module. Next up, to complete your project efficiently, you really should test at every possible stage. 
I personally think it's foolish to leave your testing until the whole design is printed and assembled. So as early and often as I could, I kept on testing the function of my mechanism to spot problems and make improvements. This included making sure the gears were meshing properly, but more importantly, filling the mechanism with grain and ensuring that it was in fact shooting out the front. We can see here in this early test that every time I connected power, grain didn't necessarily come out the front. I could see the wheel spinning, but the feed of grain and seed was running dry. And you might recall, I noticed a similar problem when testing the original seed system. Because I caught this problem in testing early on, I was able to add this simple little part. I upgraded to a longer bolt that goes through the bearings and holds the spinning wheel, drilling a hole in the upper housing to avoid a reprint so this could pass through, and then this new piece simply screws onto that bolt with a lock nut over the top so it can't ever come free. As the motor turns the wheel, this will spin around and dislodge any stuck grain from the entrance. This iteration was immediately tried out indoors in the testing bucket where it proved to be very effective. But imagine how frustrating it would have been to only discover this problem if I had put everything together and mounted it on the fence first. Yes, the design needed to be changed, but the earlier in the project you can do this, the easier it will be. Another form of testing you can do is when you're trying to design to match a difficult surface. You can take a photo of this surface, import it into CAD and use it as a reference. But before going any further, print a version that's only a couple of layers thick so you can put it over the part and see what does and doesn't need adjustment. You can mark down any changes, head back to CAD and repeat this process to get it spot on nice and early. Of course, there's sometimes elements that won't present themselves fully until the final thing is together. And in my case, that's the goats who always want to explore the world with their mouths. I made sure to spray them in the face a few times and at this stage they seem to be scared of it. But if they start being pests, I do have the option of implementing that lid or instead this bolt-on goat guard to keep them away from the food. Hopefully most people already realize this and that's that 3D printing is great for jigs and templates. As an example in this project, we know that with my design, we have bolts going through the PVC pipe into the upper housing. And that means taking the PVC pipe and drilling nine perfectly spaced holes at the exact offset from the lip if we expect everything to line up when assembling. This job becomes very easy if you print yourself a quick jig. This one is simple but effective. The pipe slots into the jig and then we use it to drill the series of holes around the outside and they will be in the exact location they need to be. Once you start making your own 3D printed jigs, it makes all kinds of other jobs much, much easier. And last but certainly not least, you should borrow from previous success. Remember that part of my design that holds a Deutsch plug snapped into place? Well, I've actually solved that problem before. And that was when I designed and built the pellet feeder for the goats. In that case, I needed a six pin Deutsch connector, but the principle was the same and it was working perfectly. So I went back into the CAD for that design and found this specific part, importing it directly into this new project before making a quick alteration to convert to a two pin plug, but keeping all of the same clearances that I knew worked from the original design. I did a very similar thing with these clamps that hold the PVC pipe to the fence. I had previously created some similar brackets that held the old chicken feeder to some posts, and I'd witnessed the goats try and break in and stand up on this and put all of their weight on it. So again, I recycled a proven design rather than starting the whole thing from scratch. There you have it, six tips that I hope will apply to your design projects and help you be more successful. Sharing is caring, so let me know in the comments if you've got any good tips to add. Thank you to my miniature goats for always making me laugh. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printed project making. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.